So welcome to Sullivan Hall and our celebration in honor of Justice Mary I. Yu of the Washington Supreme Court. I am Annette Clark, the proud dean and an even prouder alumna of Seattle University School of Law, and I have the pleasure of emceeing this event this evening. November is Native American and Alaska Native Heritage Month, and so, as we do with all of our programs, we begin with a land acknowledgement. As we begin our gathering, we respectfully acknowledge that our event today is taking place on the homelands of the Coast Salish peoples who continue to steward these lands and waters as they have since time immemorial. We recognize tribal nations and organizations who actively create, shape, and contribute to our thriving community at Seattle University and beyond. We, as an academic community, should be and are committed to doing our part to engage with and amplify the voices of Native peoples and tribes. We acknowledge our collective responsibility to advance proper education of, na <coughs> proper education of Native peoples and tribes and call for further learning and action to support the Native people of the land. Continuing with acknowledgments, I would like to recognize several luminaries in our midst, some of whom we will be hearing from shortly. First, the members of our Washington Supreme Court who are in attendance, Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez, <laughs> and of course, our guest of honor, Justice Mary Yu. Justice Yu, Yu is joined by members of her family, her partner, Aline Flower, her brother, Richard Yu, and her sister-in-law, Anita Zankatin. Next, I want to recognize the acclaimed artist who painted the portrait of Justice Yu that we'll be unveiling tonight, Alfredo Aragin. We are also joined by Seattle University's new president, Eduardo Peñalver. He will be offering remarks later in our program. We have in attendance many members of the judiciary, too many to name, but please know that we are honored by your presence. I do think it is appropriate, though, to call out two judges. First, the Honorable Tana Lin, who was very recently, <laughs> Judge Lin was very recently confirmed as a federal judge in the Western District of Washington. She is the first Asian American federal district court judge in our state's history. And second, the Honorable John Chun of the Washington Court of Appeals. <laughs> Judge Chun was just nominated to the federal district court bench and is undergoing the confirmation process as we speak. Um, and I didn't see Mario Barnes, is he here? No. I was gonna welcome Mario Barnes from the University of Washington School of Law. Um, he recently has announced that he is stepping down from the deanship, which we are sad about, um, but we're happy for Mario. Um, having acknowledged those individuals, now let me turn to expressing our gratitude to the entire community of people and organizations, especially the minority bar, bar associations, such as the Asian Bar Association of Washington, Q Law, the, the Latino Latina Bar Association of Washington, Lauren Miller Bar, and all who helped provide funding for the Portrait of Justice U and the Endowed Student Scholarship we've established in her name. We are so grateful for your support. This night would truly not be possible without the many of you who stepped forward and gave generously and assisted with our efforts. It was a community effort in the best sense and I am particularly thankful for the leadership group who assisted me, 
namely Chief Justice Gonzalez, Justice Charles Johnson, Professor Bob Chang of our Korematsu Center, and Kelly Testi, pre president of the Law School Admission Council. In terms of this celebration, the most important among those I just named is Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez, whose idea it was to commission Justice Yu's portrait and to hang it in the Temple of Justice alongside the portrait of Justice Charles C. Smith as a reminder to everyone who visits our state's Supreme Court that representation matters. It is his vision, along with some help from Professor Bob Chang, that we have brought to fruition this evening. Not only the stunning portrait we will unveil, but the endowed student scholarship in Justice Yu's name, both of which will be a part of Seattle University's School of Law in perpetuity. And so, let me ask Chief Justice Gonzalez, Gonzalez, a visionary leader in his own right, to come forward and offer remarks in honor of his colleague, Justice Mary Yu, as we recognize and celebrate the diversity on our Washington Supreme Court. Chief Justice Gonzalez. What, what an event, what an evening, and what an honor it is to be here before all of you. It's been so long since I've been with so many friends. Uh, and it's great to meet again the new president. Uh, very proud of you, and I know that you have great things in store for all of us here who care about this community. And to Dean Clark uh, for the kind introduction, and Professor Bob Chang for helping uh, with so many things, but also with this project. We're doing it because we care so much about the students who graduate from Seattle University. One of the best graduates ever from this school is my senior law clerk, Laura Anglin, who is here. And we're focusing now in particular on people who are marginalized, have been excluded, and whose voice is critically important, and that's women of color. And so it's wonderful to see such a magnificent leader as Justice Yu represented in the portrait that you're about to see later this evening uh, in living color. It is truly more stunning than you can get from just the reproduction on the brochure that you've seen. And I want to mention my dear friend Alfredo Arreguin, the artist who painted uh, this portrait. He was willing to paint the portrait of C.Z. Smith Justice C.Z. Smith and Justice Yu, despite me telling him both times that I didn't know if or how it would ever get paid for. <laughs> <clears throat> he is a beautiful person with a generous spirit uh, and such talent that you'll all see in a few moments. People notice who is represented and they notice who is not. And that's how these ideas came about from uh, our then seven-year-old son who noticed at the temple when my appointment was announced that nobody on the wall looks like us. It's the observation of a seven-year-old, and it's what led me to the promise that that would change. And with Alfredo's help, uh, it started with the portrait of Charles Z. E. Smith. Uh, it's now in the portrait of Justice Mary Yu. Um, and there may be yet another portrait that's also been uh, painted. Uh, but not just the art. Now the art matters because we want people from diverse backgrounds to see themselves as future justices. And just as important, we want everyone else to change their stereotype of what a justice looks like. This is what a justice looks like. We all know uh, of the tireless work that Justice Yu puts in, uh, not just on the legal work that we share, but on mentoring other people. So many of you have been touched by that mentorship. I know that I have. I wouldn't be here but for that. So she is the first woman of color on the Supreme Court, the first open LGBTQ member of our court. Uh, and those things matter. 
They, they matter to our society, to the optimism that we share about the prospect for real progress that we're working together to try to achieve. It's my honor to work with you on the court, just as you. I'll have to say that when I first asked just as you to pose for a photograph that Alfreda would use to make the portrait, uh, she said no. <laughs> there may have been some other words strung together to, f <laughs> to form a sentence, um, but she said no. And I, I said, it's not about you, Mary, with, with all due respect. It's about the people who you influence. It's about the future. It's about what you stand for. And she relented. With Aline's help, we convinced her to allow this to happen. And I'm so glad that you agreed. Uh, those words maybe were later used back against me, uh, but that's a different story. The, the painting is exquisite, and you'll see it in a bit. I'm so proud of the community that has come together one day it will hang at the Temple of Justice in the library where the public can see it, but right now the Temple of Justice is closed. It's closed and it's going to undergo, we hope, if the funding comes through, renovations for probably another year and a half to two years. So given that it has nowhere in the interim to hang, the original will hang here until we have a proper place for it at the Supreme Court. So with that, I won't take any more of your time just to express my gratitude to all of you for recognizing my dear friend, Justice Mary Yu. Thank you so much, Chief Gonzalez. So it's my opportunity to talk about my friend and colleague, Justice Mary Yu. And I want to talk about what she's meant to Seattle University School of Law in her role as distinguished jurist in residence, as well as co-chair of the Washington Leadership Institute, through which she has mentored and advised so many law students and new attorneys. As I told this year's 1Ls during orientation, Justice Yu is the one person we can't do without for that program. Seriously, we could skip me or any of my other colleagues in administration or our faculty and perhaps even the president and provost of Seattle University, but the show cannot go on without Mary Yu. And to show you the lengths that we'll go to, two years ago, we interrupted her vacation and flew her from California to Seattle and then back again. <laughs> Last year, we had her speak remotely since we were all online. And this year, we asked her to take time away again from her much earned and well-deserved vacation to speak virtually. And it turns out she was speaking virtually from a bathroom <laughs> in her friend's condo where she had rigged up several light rings and had a stately and professional virtual courtroom background. So the students had no idea. It was only after she posted a photo of the elaborate setup online that I learned that she was zooming into orientation from a bathroom. We asked Justice Yu to go to these lengths because she is the living embodiment of our law school's mission to educate the next generation of powerful advocates for justice. As Chief Justice Gonzalez noted, Mary Yu is the first Asian, the first Latina, and the first member of the LGBTQ community to serve on the Washington Supreme Court. That's a lot of firsts. And while we celebrate them and her, we must also acknowledge the burden of constantly being the first and paving the way for others as well as the obstacles she has undoubtedly faced and which underlie all that she's achieved in her stellar career. I will never forget Jeffrey Robinson talking with our students about his righteous anger as a black man in our country and how he channels that anger into his phenomenal civil rights advocacy. Justice Yu doesn't talk very much about her own righteous anger or frustration or her fears as an LGBTQ woman of color 
holding a position of power in the United States. But I can tell you from observation how she channels those inevitable emotions. And that is into resolve with a capital R. She is a person of action and is absolutely determined to make a difference in this world. Just as she was a powerful role model for all of us through her ideals and values, her commitment to the rule of law and our system of justice, her belief in the dignity and value of every human being, her willingness to champion the importance of diversity and inclusion every single day, and her insistence that those in the legal profession do the work of justice and equity for all. In trying to identify what is so unique about Justice Yu, because she is unique, I've come to realize that she is one of the most present individuals I have ever met. Alert, inquiring, caring, watchful. She's watching me right now. <laughs> so you just watch her facial expressions, and you do not want to see her frown. She's conjoling, encouraging, demanding. She challenges us through a remarkable combination of candor, compassion, and accountability to be the best people, the best lawyers, and the best citizens we can be. She exercises the power she's earned through her competence and hard work, and she exercises that power responsibly, carefully, thoughtfully, and with intention, always mindful of the impact her decisions and actions and words will have on those around her whether they be pro se litigants, attorneys who are, who are appearing before the court, or new lawyers and law students who are trying to make their way and aspire to be like her. In thinking about the incredible impact that she's had on our students, what came to mind for me is a quote from Maya Angelou in her book, All God's Children Need Traveling Shoes, in which she said, the ache for home lives in all of us, the safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned. For our first generation students, those who have been othered and minoritized, those who live lives of intersectionality and difference, Justice You gives the gifts of hope and belonging. She says over and over again, both through her words and her actions, you belong here, you can do this. Those are messages they desperately need to hear as they deal with the alienating experience that law school can be. And they need to hear it from someone who is more than a representation, but rather a person of genuine influence and power who sees them in all their uniqueness and individuality and who values them. I have been privy to some of these extraordinary conversations last year held via Zoom uh, we called it Zoom happy hour with Justice Yu. Um, in these small group settings, we allowed only 20 students in. She took all of the students' questions. She would speak of her faith, her own intersecting identities, how she stays hopeful in a world that is often dark, the cases and clients she most remembers, and her hopes and dreams for the future. And remarkably, after hosting four of those Zoom sessions for our students, she requested that we do them again in the spring. But this time she turned it around so that she was asking the questions of the students, learning about their perspectives, experiences, fears and struggles, and hopes and dreams that they were bringing as they joined the legal profession and eventually become its leaders. I have heard her over and over again inviting our students to contact her, offering to mentor them on their journeys, particularly encouraging them to apply for an externship with her, even if they're not in the top of the class academically. That message of hope and belonging helps these students feel at home in our law school and in the profession. These students believe Justice Yu because of who she is and what she represents to them, and they can see themselves in her. There's a reason we're on the court level tonight, rather than on the second floor gallery where we hold most of our events. This is student space, with classrooms and lockers and student organization tables, 
When a Pilsa hosts its karaoke night, this is where they do it. And we knew from the beginning that this is where Justice U's portrait belongs, centered in a space that our students claim is their own, and adjacent to the pair of statues right here, entitled The Wanderers, who are forever engaged in the search for truth and justice. In honoring Justice U this evening, we are mindful and respect the fact that she is not our alumna. She graduated from Notre Dame Law School. And yet we hope that she thinks of Seattle U Law as her law school home, that place we all ache for, where we can go as we are and not be questioned. And it is her spirit and her inspir inspirational message of hope and belonging that we seek to represent to our community, particularly our students, through the beautiful portrait that now graces our wall and through the endowed scholarship that bears Justice Yu's name. And so, in concluding my remarks, Justice Yu, I say to you, leader among us, our friend, our colleague, and hero, welcome home. It is now my great honor to introduce Eduardo Peñalver, Seattle University's new and 22nd president. He is an individual of firsts as well, the first person of color to be dean at, a, at an Ivy League law school, Cornell, which is where he joined us from, and now Seattle University's first BIPOC and first lay president. But best of all, President Peñalver is one of us, a lawyer. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Annette. Um, it's great, always great to be at the law school and uh, with my dean. Uh, uh, wonderful to be with you all this evening. I'm particularly honored to be in the presence of so many esteemed jurists. Uh, I'm gonna just call out Chief Justice Gonzalez, of course, and, and Justice Yu, whom we're here to, to honor tonight. It was, it was wonderful to meet you and, and to be here to celebrate you. Um, and we're also honored by the presence of the distinguished artist, Alfredo Arreguin, whose uh, portrait um, we're going to unveil. My mom first met him uh, over 40 years ago when she worked at Seattle Children's hospital here in Seattle and uh, was the director of play therapy and Alfredo painted a mural there and ev actually everyone in my family has one of his paintings in our in our home and I um, I have two of them in uh, in my office here at Seattle University I have a, a one of his portraits of Our Lady of Guadalupe that is on loan from my parents house and they're, they're very um, insistent that it is alone uh, they do not <laughs> They did not give it to me. It's a beautiful portrait, and, and I have one of um, Orca's as well. Um, your work is an inspiration to all of us, but it's a special source of pride for the Hispanic community here in Washington State and, and, and in the United States. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's so appropriate that we are here to honor Justice Yu this evening. Uh, it couldn't um, be more important to have her distinctive voice on our state's Supreme Court along with the Chief Justices. Um, you know, around the same time that, that Donald Trump was kicking off his 2016 campaign, the U.S. Census Bureau announced that for the first time in American history, a majority of young American children are not white. And, and this is really kind of an astonishing fact when you think about it. When my parents were teenagers, the United States was 90% white. And today the country as a whole is 70% white and uh, among the generation coming up behind Generation Z. so the uh, those born after 2010, uh, over 25% are Hispanic and 49% and are white. And now these numbers are kind of familiar to anyone who's been paying attention. We hear them a lot. The, we're accustomed to this idea of the browning of America and we, we take it for granted. But it's really an astonishing demographic transformation, both in its speed and its scale. And of course, it's deeply unsettling and disorienting uh, for some. And, you know, despite all the complexities at work, in the political dynamics of our country, uh, I think I'll, <laughs> the, the transformation uh, remains for me the most likely explanation for a great deal of what we've, 
what we've been witnessing here. Um, and then as evidence of this, I would point to the increasing prominence of the so-called great replacement theory within conservative political discourse. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Tucker Carlson lamented, and I'll quote, the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries. I don't think he was referring to indigenous people, the legacy Americans. And, and um, former speaker Newt Gingrich recently accused the, I'll quote, the anti-American left of trying to drown, and again, I'll quote, traditional classic Americans with people who know nothing of American traditions or the rule of law. Now, in my most optimistic moments, my take on this is that America is having what we might call a Proposition 187 moment, um, maybe longer than a moment. But, but the reason Proposition 187 was not the last word on uh, undocumented people in California was the democratic process, which harnessed demographic change in that state to punish the proponents of that proposition with political exile from which they have yet to return. And so for this reason, the most troubling manifestation of the current moment we're in, to my mind, is the proliferation of voter suppression efforts around the country, laws aimed at erecting pointless obstacles to voting by, uh, that are designed really to disproportionately filter out black and Hispanic and young voters. The health of our democratic experiment ultimately depends on sustaining our system of democratic representation, and these voter suppression efforts really threaten to short circuit that and undermine and distort our political process and the legal profession, particularly the courts, are crucial players for defeating those efforts. Beyond fighting against laws that aim to distort our electoral process by suppressing brown votes, at the deepest level, what we need to defeat is a narrow and racialized conception of what it means to be an American. And uh, this is an account that is really presupposed by that great replacement rhetoric. We need to counter this wrong-headed view with an inclusive vision of America, a conception not based in blood or soil, but one that focuses on our shared democratic values, our, our shared commitment to America's legal institutions. We're a nation of laws, and we're bound together by, by loyalty to our constitutional system. And so the legal profession will always have a really central role to play in elaborating and propagating that more inclusive vision. And so for these reasons, it's absolutely essential that above all others, our profession fully reflect the diversity of our country and its commitment to equal justice. Uh, Justice Sonia Sotomayor attracted a great deal of criticism during her confirmation process uh, when she said that as a Latina, I think she said, why is Latina? Uh, her experience would bring an important perspective to her judging, one that had not been well represented on the federal bench. And, and some commentators accused her of being racist for saying that. But in touting the value of her perspective for a very homogeneous federal judiciary, becoming less homogeneous, as we heard earlier, Justice Sotomayor was merely confirming what social scientists have consistently uh, observed, right? That, that diverse groups deliberate more effectively than homogeneous ones, right? That diverse groups bring the varied perspectives and experiences of their members to bear on the problems that they set out to analyze and examine. They've, they have fewer blind spots. They're less prone to making unfounded assumptions. They perform better. Uh, a few years ago, Justice Sotomayor wrote a, a very powerful dissent in the 2016 case of Utah versus Streif. Uh, in that case, the Supreme Court took an expansive view of the power of the police to stop and search citizens even without reasonable suspicion. The issue is a technical one. I'm not a criminal lawyer, so uh, consult with someone else. But I'm, um, I'll describe it as best I can understand it. A man had been stopped by the police as he walked out of a house uh, in which the police officer suspected drug activity. The police officer admitted that he had no basis for suspecting that the defendant himself had committed a crime. But after he detained the defendant and requested his ID, he ran a database search and discovered that the defendant had a small traffic warrant. And so the officer arrested the man on the warrant and then searched him. And only then he found that he was uh, carrying meth. And in upholding the legality of this search and the admissibility of the, the meth, the Supreme Court majority held that the discovery of the warrant remedied what otherwise would have been uh, an illegal detention of the defendant, since the officer admitted, as I said, at the time that he made the stop, he had no grounds for suspecting anything. Justice Sotomayor disagreed with this post hoc justification for what would have otherwise have been an unlawful search, and so she dissented. 
I want to set aside the ultimate question in the case. Reasonable minds may, may differ on this issue. Justice Breyer, uh, certainly a reasonable person uh, in my book, sided with the majority in this case. Uh, but Justice Sotomayor disagreed with the court about more than the outcome. In, in her dissent, and this is what I think is so important about her presence on the court and the presence of, of uh, the, the existence of a diverse judiciary, uh, she took the majority opinion to task for its description of the initial stop and the officer's demand for proof of ID as, quoting from the majority, a negligibly burdensome precaution. Writing only for myself, Justice Sotomayor said, and drawing on my professional experiences, I would add that Unlawful stops have severe consequences much greater than the inconvenience suggested by the name. When police stop you because they're genuinely enforcing traffic laws, she explained, the majority's description may be accurate. But she continued, when the stop is a pretext, something the police are doing because they're looking for evidence of more serious crime, they behave differently and the stops quickly become degrading and intimidating. Now the defendant in Streif was white, but Justice Sotomayor observed, uh, that it's no secret that people of color are disproportionate victims of this kind of scrutiny. Before he was shot and killed in 2016 by a police officer in a routine traffic stop, Philando Castile had been stopped 46 times for things like driving too slowly or having a license plate light that was burned out. And as a result of police officers' focus on people of color and the arbitrary nature of these stops, their effect is to identify people of color as second-class citizens, Justice Sotomayor explained. She contended that the black and Latino young men disproportionately subjected to these kinds of illegal searches are not matters of concern only to members of their communities, of our communities. These, these young black and Latino men, she said, are canaries in the coal mine whose deaths, civil and literal, warn us that no one can breathe in this atmosphere, a much quoted line. Now, my purpose in discussing the case with you at such length is not, again, to take an issue on the, on the narrow uh, legal question in the street. But my purpose is to underscore the importance of, of Justice Sotomayor's voice and perspective on the Supreme Court and the presence of justices like Justice Yu and Chief Justice Gonzalez on the Washington State Supreme Court. Including their voices in the deliberation of these courts affords them as collective bodies a wisdom, a perspective that they would otherwise lack. It improves the courts. And that Justice Sotomayor failed to win a majority for her position in no way diminishes the value of her presence. I mean, as any observer of courts will remind you, today's powerful dissents often lay the foundation for tomorrow's landmark victories. And certainly viewing the opinions in Streif through the lens of the horrific incidents that gave rise to the protests in 2020 only heightens my appreciation for their prescience of Justice Sotomayor's words. And so it strikes me as no accident that the Washington State Supreme Court that includes the voices of both Chief Justice Gonzalez and Justice Yu distinguished itself by publishing a very powerful statement in the wake of those protests on racial equity through, uh, the, in the midst of those protests, uh, a statement that reverberated through our profession far beyond the state of Washington and, and which Seattle University's 1Ls, I believe, read uh, this year as part of their orientation. As our country grapples with the future and with what it means to, to be an American in the time of rapid demographic transformation, as we struggle to sustain our democratic norms against erosion by people who seem increasingly uncomfortable with democracy, we need greater diversity on our courts. We need greater diversity in our prosecutor's offices, in our law firms, and in our law school classrooms on both sides of the podium, including here at Seattle University's Law School. And so one of my priorities as president here will be working hard to achieve that diversity among our students, but also among our faculty and in our university administration. Again, thank you all for being here tonight. Congratulations, Justice Yu. Thank you for sharing your voice with our court, and I'm looking forward to the rest of tonight's program. Thank you, President Penalver. We feel fortunate to have your voice at Seattle University. We are actually going to change up the order of the program. We had originally ant anticipated doing the unveiling, which is over there, but then we wanted to talk about the scholarship here, so I'm going to do them in the reverse order. Um, so there are two concrete ways in which we are celebrating Justice U this evening. 
Um, and the first of those is the Endowed Scholarship, the Justice Mary U. Endowed Scholarship for Students. Um, this scholarship will be given to a student each year with strong consideration to be given to students who are underrepresented at Seattle University School of Law, especially women of color. This scholarship is endowed at the $100,000 level. Um, what an endowment means is that that $100,000 will remain forever and it will spin off interest income, which we will then be able to use for generations of women of color who attend our law school. It is now my pleasure to introduce Chris Kristen DiBiase. She is our Associate Dean for Student Affairs she is going to award the inaugural Justice U Scholarship and invite that student to make brief remarks. Hmm. This is what my face looks like. <laughs> and I will digress very briefly to say um, hello, everyone, and thank you for all of the welcome wishes that I've received from those of you since I began in January. It's very nice to meet many of you in person for the very first time. Good evening. I am thrilled to speak with you for a few minutes about our inaugural awardee of the Justice Mary U Endowed Scholarship, Mix Aaron Lewis. Something unique about Aaron is that they style their name in all lowercase. Whenever I see someone who does that, it immediately evokes thoughts of the author Bell Hooks, who, it has been said, styles her name that way, to center not herself, but instead the work that she does. That seems fitting for Erin, too. I first met them earlier this fall when they volunteered for one of the open slots for mental health first aid training a few months ago. Not a training to take lightly with its very serious curriculum and for a first year student, the sacrifice of an entire Saturday worth its weight in gold in law school, as we all know. During that training, I was impressed by Aaron's skill of recognizing in certain moments when their own unique voice was needed and how to use it to bring a focus to helping others. That is a skill they display with confidence and humility in the classroom honed through their work as a Title IX investigator and an inclusion advocate for the Seattle Colleges District. Erin is also very thoughtful with a fierce passion for justice. As a first year law student with this skill and these experiences, they tend to think expansively about things beyond just what is right in front of them when considering various facets of issues and they also bring their whole person into their experiences and to how they approach and interact with people. With a, temperant, a temperament reminiscent of so many things that I might admire the most about Justice U, there was no doubt that this was the perfect choice to be the first of many who will receive an award bearing her name. I'm so very proud and honored to award the inaugural Justice Mary U Endowed Scholarship to Mix Aaron Lewis. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening, justices and judges. Um, I just wanted to let you all know that this is such an incredibly meaningful gift and I am humbled and honored to be receiving this scholarship in the name of Justice Mary Yu, um, who certainly is not only a trailblazer, but is all of our wildest dreams come true. Uh, you know, I am a non-traditional student as part of the inaugural Flex JD program. I also am non-binary and of color, and the space that this endowed scholarship has made for people like me 
is incredibly, incredibly meaningful, more meaningful than I can truly express. I did not actually see myself ever in law or even as a law student because of the lack of representation and the way that this scholarship dedicates space, energy, time, and funds to the future, not only of the legal profession, but also of our world community um, is so impactful. So thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for just being you. <laughs> Justice Mary you. We love you very much. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations, Aaron. The second way in which we want to concretely honor Justice Yu is through the unveiling of the incredible portrait painted by Alfredo Aragin. Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, as, as Chief Justice Gonzalez already mentioned, um, this is the original portrait, which we did not expect we were gonna have the opportunity to hang and unveil. Um, so we will take advantage of the fact that the Temple of Justice needs a new HVAC system and <laughs> what, whatever else it is, and, and we will take such good care of this portrait for as long as we are the Baylors of it. Um, when, when it does um, end up being transmitted to the Temple of Justice, um, we have an equally lovely print of that portrait, um, which we will then hang in this space. What I'm gonna ask everyone to do, if you would, um, is to um, head this way. We'd like to gather around the portrait. Uh, Professor Bob Chang is going to do the unveiling for us. Um, and before you go, but just hold on a second. Um, so what I would like us to do after it's been unveiled um, is to first applaud um, the creator of this amazing work of art and then to honor Justice Yu one final time this evening. And with that, we will conclude our program. Um, it will give everyone the opportunity to stand up close, to look at the portrait, and to spend time talking with um, the incredible, unique, and wonderful Justice Yu, who we dearly love. So there's one slight thing I omitted, which is the opportunity for Justice Yu to give remarks. <laughs> Not quite sure how I did that. So instead of talking to her individually, you will have the opportunity to hear from Justice Yu. I think it's great to be a PS. <laughs> it really is. It's great. It's great. <laughs> I'll really just spend a few moments expressing um, some gratitude and maybe just say a couple of things that I hope um, that you might take with you. Um, and, and part of it is it's really important to say thank you, and it's really important to express gratitude uh, for the privilege of even just standing here um, with you tonight. I want to thank my family, my friends, my colleagues, uh, my judicial colleagues are always very special to me um, because we know what we're trying to do um, each day. Um, we have an incredibly talented artist, Alfredo. Where is Alfredo Adeguin? Alfredo. I especially thank Dean Clark, Bob Chang, the incredible staff and faculty at Seattle University. Um, but there are two people that I really want to just 
express deep, deep gratitude to. And the first is to Chief Justice Stephen Gonzalez. And I just have to tell you that Steve and I have traveled many, many years together as trial judges and now at the Supreme Court. And we're not just colleagues, um, but we're dear friends. And we may be the symbolic two people here, the wanderers uh, in search of justice. And I can't think of anyone that I would rather do that with other than you, Steve. I love you dearly and thank you very, very much. I'm going to add a footnote to that in a moment, but I also want to thank Aline Flower. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, we all know, right, that the person that we live with and who loves us dearly um, is the person who knows us best in so many ways. And Aline has been nothing but supportive um, through this journey, the journey of trying to do the best that I can for the people uh, on the Supreme Court, but also um, trying to do our best to be good people. Um, Aline is the sweetest, smartest lawyer that I know, um, and each day challenges me to be just a little bit more kind and a little bit more patient. So thank you, Aline. I love you. The footnote that I wanted to add, um, and it's important for all of you to know this, is because Alfredo has become sort of the Supreme Court artist, as far as I'm concerned. And I just want everyone to know um, that when you have a good friend and they do a good deed, right, what should you do? Return the deed. Yeah? So the next unveiling at some point in the future is a beautiful portrait of Justice Stephen Gonzalez. <laughs> it currently hangs in my chambers at the moment, and it's beautiful and captures his spirit in so many ways. But what's significant about that, again, is Alfredo was the artist who painted that portrait. Um, but the thing that is most significant to me, and those of you who know me, is institutional change is the most important thing institutional change, where that institution changes a behavior or a habit and does something different. The portraits of Justice Smith and myself um, were because of heroic efforts of Justice Gonzalez, but the portrait of Justice Gonzalez was commissioned by the State Supreme Court and paid for by the State Supreme Court. That is change. That is real change. So I'll say a few things before uh, we end the evening. And I just have to tell you, <laughs> it's very strange to stand here and see <laughs> a portrait of oneself. Um, it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> um, and yet I just have to say that every time that I do look at this portrait is I see my ancestors and I see the dreams um, that led them to this country. And when I see this portrait, I see the changing face of our judiciary. Despite the strange feeling of seeing oneself in the portrait, I have forced myself, Steve, um, to get past it. And that's because, as I have been reminded, it is something larger than me. It represents something bigger than me. It represents an immigrant story. It represents opportunity for all and it represents the importance of mentorship. I could not have traveled the path that I have without mentors. Mentors who invested in me as a person, as a lawyer, as a judge. And I just have to say, mentors like Norm Mailing, like Ruth Wu, like Bobby Bridge, 
friends like Ann Levinson, who's been there with me, Lisa Brodoff, Rhonda Salveson, people who have loved me like Sharon Sakamoto, who have given me courage each day and confidence to say that people like me must have a voice and have a place in this world. I could not be a member of the Supreme Court without these mentors and friends and without the help and the support of my dear, dear law clerks and my judicial externs. And frankly, without the support and fun of the students from Seattle University School of Law. I loved those happy hours, Dean. <laughs> My friends, each of us, and I think as reminded by the president, the complexities of our world and our American society at this particular time in history needs great lawyers. Lawyers who will carry on the work of justice, who will have the vision, the courage, and the integrity to call us to do better and to be better. And we will have great lawyers if we have students with diverse experiences of life and to ensure that they are nurtured in environments like Seattle University, each one of us has the responsibility to be that nurturing mentor to these students. It can't be just me. It can't just be the dean. It just can't be a scholarship. It is the responsibility of every single lawyer to nurture, to mentor, to love into existence lawyers with courage. Because racism and sexism still exists, I ask each of you to please, to continue to do all that you can for women of color as they make the choice to enter law school and to enter into our profession. Support these women who start in this building afraid, needing support, needing encouragement, needing a platform to articulate their great vision of who we could be and how much better we need to do. I can't say it enough. Mentoring means nurturing, and it means walking with another in their journey to greatness. I want to thank each one of you for joining me on my journey to be here today. Nobody, nobody gets the opportunities to do what I have done without the support of others. I love each one of you, and I can't thank you enough for everything that you have given me. And I'm asking you to continue to give me that support, that love and encouragement, because I'm not retiring, I'm not dead. <laughs> And I've only been re-inspired because of this. Because again, as I look at this portrait, I see the story of immigrants. And I see the story that challenges us to make sure that we create room for the next generation for, and for the gifts that they will bring to us. I believe that we have a better future. I believe that we will be better people. And I thank you again, especially the judges in this room, for your service your courage, and you keeping up the good work that you have through this very tough, tough 18 months. You're the, the people in our community that deserve our thanks, so thank you. I didn't plan that order, <laughs> but how fitting that the final words we hear on this wonderful celebratory evening come from Justice U. 
Again, thank you, all of you, for joining us um, and joining in this celebration of Justice U. We wish you good evening. Thank you.